I work at Optimism. I focus on security in our protocol. I previously was an auditor and co-founded Diligence with Gonzalo uh, and have had the good fortune of working as a client with these three gentlemen, uh, and not yet Sertora, but have had an opportunity to get to know them really well. Um, so I really feel in my element and I'm excited to have this conversation. So uh, I'll let them introduce themselves quickly. If you could, you know, Give us your names and tell us about your firms and what makes you special. I can go first. Hey, guys. Um, and thank you, Rajiv, yeah, if you're watching. Um, yeah, we co-founded Consensus Diligence almost six years ago now, or going to that. Um, me and John, uh, who's now at Optimism, unfortunately. And uh, Consensus Diligence is a, a crypto-native security firm that it has uh, for the entirety of its life done security services um, and has also a product side, which you might have seen. Um, so Mythex and more recently Diligence Fuzzing and a bunch of other smaller tools that are all open source that you can check on our website. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Chandra and uh, I'm from Sertora. Sertora is a automated auditing company, you can think of it as that way. Uh, what we do is uh, we uh, use formal verification techniques to uh, prove certain properties about your smart contracts. And I'm personally more on the R&D side. And uh, one of the things that we are focusing on these days is how do you have more trust on the specifications that you write? Because at the end of the day, that's really what uh, we are using as the ground truth for verifying your smart contracts. So if you have any questions about formal verification, I would love to hear about those. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Mehdi, co-founder and director of Sigma Prime. Um, we're an information security consultancy focused on blockchain technology, um, doing a lot of smart contract auditing, as you can imagine, but very comfortable diving deeper into other layers of the stack. Um, as John mentioned, layer two systems, uh, new L1s and whatnot. Um, we're also the founders and maintainers of Lighthouse the Rust implementation of the uh, Ethereum consensus protocol. Some of you here, I'm sure, are running validators. Um, some of you may be running Lighthouse as well. Um, we had the merge a few weeks ago. Massive milestone for everyone. Massive milestone for Sigma Prime. And uh, yeah. Hi, everybody. I'm Jonathan Alexander. I am CTO at Open Zeppelin. Open Zeppelin, we are a uh, security advisor, security auditor. We also work on Open Zeppelin contracts. Open Zeppelin Defender, and we are core development contributors to Forda. And hi, everybody. I'm Nick Selby. I'm with Trail of Bits. We are an audit and research company based in New York, but people are all around the world. Uh, in addition to audits, we have a, a research group that, that mainly works on just sort of pushing the edges of, of a bunch of different technologies, including blockchain, uh, and where are things going next? And uh, we make some pretty popular open source tools like Slither and Echidna, which probably several of you are, you know, familiar with. Thanks, I'm glad to be here. Awesome, thanks everyone. Uh, so first question I think is like maybe a bit of a softball just to get us going. Uh, and I'll, I'll pose this to Mehdi first and then just let the conversation get going. So it's been three years since the last DevCon. What do you see as the biggest changes in that time? Maybe it's something you're excited about, something you're worried about. We'd love to hear it. Yeah, interesting. Um, let's see. I think what I've been noticing is the um, quality of the projects that we've been reviewing has um, somewhat improved over the past three years. Uh, there's caveats, obviously. Uh, we still get the occasional you know, DeFi project with you know, lack of access control and uh, the typical uh, unsafe, re unsafe external calls and re-entrances. But I'd like to think that uh, thanks to some of the tooling that's been available, Trail of Bits has been doing great work on that front. Um, developers have a lot of um, abilities these days to pick up the low-hanging fruits. Um, contracts are getting more and more complex um, in the DeFi space particularly. Um, some of the lending protocols that we've been reviewing are pretty hectic. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, the amount of money 
getting stolen on a weekly basis these days um, is probably greater than what it was three years ago, I'd say. Um, but it's probably due to the fact that there's just so much more, so many more people getting into the field, a lot of uh, new projects being deployed, and obviously, you know, our time is, you know, constrained. We can't, unfortunately, service everyone all the time. Um, but yeah, so goods and bads, I guess. We've seen a lot of projects come and go too, and a lot of money come and go. So yeah, I, I think that like even I fully agree with Matty. The quality has definitely improved, and I think the bear market kind of helped at that. Okay, anybody have uh, something different to say than better quality? I have a mixed bag. All right. <clears throat> so like three years ago, it was it was a simpler time. Uh, <laughs> things, things were a lot easier to look at. Things were a lot more self-contained. Uh, and, and as you just said, right, the, the, the complexity, the, the maze of dependencies, the, uh, the, the, the complexity has kind of exploded at the same time that there's more and more value, so the stakes are much, much higher. I think on the other hand, you're right, the tooling has gotten a lot better, but it's also, I think, uh, all of us here working with, with firms that are, we're getting used to the, we're used to the risks, we're used to the threats, we're, we're inured to the patterns, we, we can see them a lot more clearly. Everybody here has a lot more experience in, in finding things. Uh, and on the other, other hand, um, three years ago, I remember being, d describing to board members of a, of a pretty large crypto company uh, about nation state threats, specifically talking about North Korea. And they kind of looked at me with blank stares and they were like, well, you know, so what? And I think that over the past three years, that, that nation state involvement has gone from a kind of a risk to a definite and definable threat. Uh, Chandra, you... So, well, this is my first DevCon, so I wasn't there in the, the, the first, the, the one three years ago. Uh, but what I've noticed is that um, there seems to, this is a very fast-moving field, and there's like uh, new terms, new buzzwords, new concepts that g keep getting thrown around a lot. Uh, but I think, you know, the main thing that I would, uh, you know, say here is I think it's important to remember that at the end of the day, uh, like companies like Sertura or like, you know, formal verification companies or like any company that is building tools for uh, verifying smart contracts, they actually rely on a very fundamental uh, concept. And I think that even though this uh, field is very fast moving, uh, the fundamentals are still the same. And, you know, those ideas uh, go really far. And I'm actually excited. I think that uh, we should be able to uh, scale some of these techniques uh, pretty well to some of the more recent uh, concepts that are coming around in this field. Nice. Okay, I'm gonna. I'll give you the next question, but let's. Yeah. We'll keep it moving. Uh, so, yeah. So, we're done with softballs. Um, Jonathan, what responsibility do auditors bear when code they've reviewed has been exploited? Thanks for. <laughs> <All right. laughs> I don't know if that's targeted. Um, you take a sip of water first. Yeah, yeah, thanks. <laughs> well, I, I think, um, first of all, I, I think all of us, because we, uh, I, I think everybody up here, we take our work so seriously that the first order of responsibility, of course, is dealing with the issue that's found. And I think that I know we at Open Zeppelin make every effort if we've had situations, I'm, I'm not going to say we've had situations where things we've missed have been found, but customers we work with maybe have a situation arise and you are a trusted security advisor to them, you're going to rally to help them in the situation and that may be in discussing what are the potential fixes and reviewing fixes and even talking about public communications and that is a, uh, I think if you are with uh, a trusted, you know, we, we view these relationships as partnerships, then that's what, what we're going to try to do. Um, I think that in the case, in a specific case where um, something is missed in an audit, which sometimes, um, like we've had some situations where uh, we'll, we'll do an audit and then before, thankfully, pre-release, uh, an issue is discovered that was missed in the audit, maybe because there was uh, 
another you know, set of eyes on it, or maybe there was internal testing. And in that case, uh, we always view our responsibility as to do a very thorough post-mortem mm -hmm. on what happened, exactly what was found, have our team analyze itself as well as get other people in our team and other, get the customer involved so that we can all learn from that and figure out and explain to ourselves and improve our processes going forward. So I think that's yeah. the very common uh, approach. Great. So so we've heard from Jonathan that it's, I, I think this is just like, like to, to preface on the same topic, but Jonathan has been open that a top tier auditor can miss something. And so you're, you're lucky, right? Like it got caught before it hit production. That can happen to anyone. So let's like put that out there. Has anybody on the stage like actually had something they've audited be exploited in a significant way? I'm curious. Not really, but we've had stuff being disclosed after it's in production. Yeah. Uh, like I, I think that like we, we Establishing, and we've said this many, many times, we're not insurance companies, right? So that's the baseline. But there's an ethical and moral code that, are like, uh, that we uphold to. And so if something happens, obviously this is also a case by case, on a case by case basis, it should be analyzed differently. Because if it's, if it's our, if the problem was created by us specifically, then it, we might react one way, whether if, if, the, if there, it was just like a, a miss, we might react some other way. But at the end of the day, we'll try our best, but we're not obligated to anything, right? Nor can we be, because that actually destroys the entire relationship. Well, I'll go, because I'm just gonna jump onto it. Uh, we, we actually don't, I, I don't think that we have a different way. I like what you said about the moral responsibility. I think it's really, it's really important. Um, I, I don't think that we have a different, um, process we have a we have a pretty stringent process to to determine um whether wh whether something was missed but but much more important is w what happened and how can we help and how can we reach out proactively they're going to be in incident response mode they're going to be their hairs on fire there's going to be media involvement they're, they're they're in a world of hurt a, a lot of us at trail of bits have worked in the incident response field so we're we're very accustomed to understanding what they need to do right now uh, to stop the burning, to stop the leaking, and, and, and get things done. So our first reaction is to, to refresh ourselves as to what we know about this project, and then uh, reach out to try to offer as much assistance as we can. I'm very, very pleased to say that the entire REC leaderboard does not have our name on it today. That, that will change, but, you know, as of right now. But, but this is a process that we take very seriously because uh, it, it can happen. There are no guarantees in audits. We, we mm -hmm. always do our very best, but I think s to stick with the customer when they're in a bad time as well as when they're in a good time is the most important thing. Do, do yeah. you want, sorry, Matt, do you want to just give us like an insight into what that process looks like? Like just one or sorry, two? Sorry, I didn't, I didn't what, hear what you actually. The, the, the process of choosing whether to help the customer or not in, in one of those situations. So the, the, the helping the customer, I mean, I, I, let me be clear because I made this same mistake in Stanford. I don't mean free, <laughs> uh, necessarily, <laughs> right? Like we, we will help, obviously, for nothing. There's certain things that we can do as auditors and, and as experts in, in the field where if there's more services required, if, if it's fixed reviews, if there's other things. But the first thing we want to do is reach out and say, hey, we saw that this happened. Do you need any, do you, know, you want to talk to us about stuff that you're, that you're doing right now? I think you, you said that pretty well. Can we agree that audits is probably the, the, one of the worst terms to describe what we actually do? Do, do we, yes, do we, we all look at it? Yeah, okay, cool. So, but it's uh, like cyber. We just inherited it. I know, and we can't do I know. About it's it. terrible. I feel so bad using the word auditing or audit every time I do, but these are really time boxed security assessments. Let's just all agree on this. As John was saying, these things are not bulletproof, right? Um, bugs will be missed, and we allocate a certain amount of time to do our best to find these uh, vulnerabilities in your code. But guess what? If you give us double the amount of time, chances are we'll probably find more bugs. Um, so let's just you know, make sure that we're all clear on what we do up here in terms of security reviews and security assessments. Okay. And by the way, that's, that's not just a CYA. Uh, it's not, you, you said the word partnership, or you said the word partnership. Um, <clears throat> 
people wait a long time for audits. It's a very important part of the process of going live with, with a product, especially a product where a lot of money, you know, if it goes bad, a lot of money can go out the door. Uh, customers have their own priorities. Customers have budgets. Customers have realities. And usually it ends up that we're not negotiating actually about money, but about time. We're not negotiating about money, but about the number of engineers who can be looking at it. So while we can't guarantee that a three-week, two-engineer audit will find all the bugs, we can guarantee that a three-week, two-engineer audit will find all the bugs that can be found by three engineers, by two engineers working for three weeks. And that, that's a different sort of guarantee. Yeah, yeah. okay. Um, so I think, I think Mehdi set this up well in that uh, by saying like, like just the semantics of what this is, what we're doing, how is it defined. Um, so we're saying time box security reviews now. Do we, need, do we need a set of standards to make it clear whatever word we choose, do we need to have a set of standards for this? And I'll give it to Chandra to, to t take a crack at it. So uh, standards for auditors, you mean? Or? For, yeah, I mean, one, that's a good place to take it mm -hmm. as well, if you like. I was thinking more for what an audit is, for what, what needs to happen during the, the course of this security yeah. review. Well, um, so, you know, I, I can perhaps uh, speak from a more automated auditing point of view, but then I think some of the ideas probably also apply to uh, human-based auditing. Uh, I think the hardest thing is to come up with what like the specification, right? Like even when you're auditing, like what are you actually looking for? I think that's uh, one of the main questions that you should very carefully think about, right? Uh, and, you know, I think one of the things that's kind of uh, difficult for auditing is uh, it, you, it's hard to be very precise. And if you're not precise, then you kind of think that you did a proof or like you have some kind of guarantee that this bug isn't there. But I think, you know, unless it's very easy to uh, feel like you, you know, audited really well if you don't have the specification correctly in your head. And um, perhaps a related uh, thing is uh, in formal verification, there's this notion of trusted computing base. And I think that idea also, uh, you know, maps to auditing. Like, what part of the code did you audit? What parts of the code did you not audit, right? And, you know, you can only say confidently, well, with some confidence that the code that you did audit maybe doesn't have uh, some vulnerabilities, but the parts that you didn't, you can't say anything about them, right? So you, it's very important to be very explicit about what the TCB is and what you verified and what you checked or whatever you audited. Anyone else? I would say I'm a little frightened of the word standard in what we do because I think sometimes it comes from the place of people hoping that we're going to simplify down to some very simple set of rules, what needs to be covered, and then anyone could cover it. And so I do think we need common language. We need, and, and Mehdi just helped us with some of our common language and understanding um, so that we're working together. But I think what's important is um, if, you're, if you're a team and you're engaging auditors, um, it, as opposed to, you want to have common language about what will be done, won't, won't, uh, what, what won't be done, but this is people also, and people with experience. So I think um, getting to know who are the actual auditors and not just, I think we were talking about this before, not just the team or the, you know, the label, but who are the specific people, what is their experience, because those are the people you're going to be working with. And, and what's more important probably than standards is agreement with who, who is going to provide you the security review and who are those people and yeah. what are their skills and what are their, what's their experience. Well, yeah, and so I'm going to like that, I, I'm going to go to the other side of that, the interpretation of the question of standards. And well, I'm, I'm going to just steal the phrasing uh, from... Uh, Rickard, who I was talking to the other day, um, he said, who odds the auditors? And, and so, you know, as a project, and I experience this now as somebody who's audited before and understands the industry 
far better than most. It's still scary, like talking to, like trying to evaluate the auditor, like for the code that I have that I want looked at, does this audit, is this the right audit firm? And do they have the right people available when I, it's, there's so many moving parts, and it's crazy. Um, but back to that, who audits the auditors? Like, is there some way that we can, that we can or should be holding, I don't want to go back to like holding auditors accountable and the skin in the game thing that we can go round and round about, but yeah, like how can, how can we help non-auditors evaluate the auditors that they're working with? Should there be some kind of third-party watchdog that's ranking you all or, or what? Like go, there's, go a, there, I think it's a place, like this, a good plug here would be like to talk about ETH Trust. And I think we all participated in the standard in one f form or another. And I think it's like a dangerous proposition because what the, the proposition of ETH Trust is that there's levels of how secure your code base is. There's like kind of a risk assessment of how your code base will look like after you have done certain things, right? So, so this, this, uh, this is part of the EEA, the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance, and I think it was uh, uh, Tom Lindemann who started it. I think it is a dangerous proposition, but it might actually be helpful if you are not super embedded into the security industry, right? Again, it has, it is useful, but it is, it should be taken with a grain of salt because like if you take level three or like formal verification as a panacea, that will probably be a disservice to you. So I'm yeah, mixed bags on getting standards for what a good security practice looks like. All right, this is a scary one, so, <laughs> oh, but I'll go ahead. I actually think in terms of security work, there, uh, and, and I think about other niches of technology, the work that, let's say, these teams here do is very public. It's, it's very public. So in some sense, we're watched yeah. very closely. And so this idea that, so our reputations are on the line all the time, all the time. And honestly, I know all of us up here, we lose sleep over it, right? Like, and, and I will say too that like it opens up when we work and opens up on contracts and we've had issues and, you know, so we're, our reputations are very public and we're all glad we're not on the rec leaderboard. And um, <laughs> so we can talk about, I think it's perfectly healthy to have conversations about how could we provide more transparency and more info, but I think we are actually very, yeah. Well watched right now. Okay. Yeah. Now, now there still is the thing about what's the right match for you as a project, and I think that's an important consideration. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you, I like how you said like you lose sleep over it. I think you know everybody in this room loses sleep about either the code that they're running or the code that they're auditing. So we should all go easier on ourselves. Um, so I just want, I want, like, I think it'd be fun to get some questions from the audience. Uh, so if you have a question, raise your hand. Uh, and meanwhile, while the mics are getting handed out, we're going to try something. Overrated, underrated, lightning round. No people, no firms. These are concepts. Uh, okay. So where should we start? Uh, Nick, uh, plain English specs. Overrated or underrated? <laughs> uh, underrated twice. Um, okay. It, it, I was actually, uh, Jocelyn Feist is here, who's the head of our blockchain, and, and he was saying, you know, you can pick the tool. You can, you can pick how it is that you want. If, if you're not able to put down in English what, what are the invariants, what are the things that you're trying to accomplish here, you're, you know, once you do that, you're 75 or 80 percent of the way through. It also, it just speaks to a number of things, not just for security review, but also just for your own understanding. Yeah. To, to be totally. able to declare this is what this thing does, yeah. you can't put a value on that. Yeah, awesome. Uh, Gonzalo, overrated or underrated? Contract upgradability. So overrated. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, expanding upgradability is a bug not always we went through this so there's a there's a longer conversation about this that happened at defi security summit i think that is available on youtube so i could rent on and on about this there's also a bunch of articles on the on the internet about this but generally speaking it you are just injecting another um attack vector in your code base okay 
All right, uh, Chandra, uh, how do you feel about, sorry, overrated or underrated, reading the code very carefully? Extremely underrated. I think we should read code extremely So we can't carefully. just write rules? And you like, can't just write no. rules. No, you definitely okay. need to understand the code before you start writing your rules. Formal verification is not a silver bullet? It's definitely not a right. silver bullet, no. But really, but really, like, how, you know, like, it's, uh, how do you know what kind of guarantees you're getting from formal verification? Uh, I mean, yeah, I think this is a very good question, right? Like, you, I, I, this kind of goes back to what I was saying before, you know, uh, it's important to think carefully about what you're proving, right? And your spec is really all you have. And, uh, you know, when you say that, it, okay, we have a formal guarantee, you should be very careful when you make these kinds of claims. And I think it's very dangerous to make these claims because, you know, um, the spec could itself be wrong. And even if the spec is reasonable, I mean, there could be a bug in the formal verification tool. And, like, then that's, you know, that's also bad. And, uh, you know, just because there is a specific bug that you verify, verify your code against does not mean that there's, uh, you know, it's just bulletproof and you can just trust it with, your life, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. Okay. Um, Manny, yep, you're up. Um, have I asked everybody something? Jonathan, you're up? Okay. All right, so you're after Manny. You'll get something, don't worry. Um, Manny, uh, alternate virtual machine design, so not the EVM. Overrated or underrated? Oh. <laughs> Overrated? Okay. I don't know. Do you wish to I, qualify I've, that? Or yeah, I don't know. Just, I've, I've been spending a lot of time in, on the EVM, so yeah. kind of getting familiar and, you know, it's got its quirks, obviously. Stockholm Syndrome, basically. Probably, like, yeah, yeah me probably, too. yeah. Um, look, no, we've, we've, we've definitely uh, done a bunch of security assessments targeting different execution environments, don't get me wrong. Um, but obviously, most developers are operating with Solidity, Viper at the EVM level. Um, it's got its quirks but it, it, it's kind of working. I'd be excited to see the um, upcoming upgrades, uh, particularly EOF, um, EVM object files, uh, that might change a lot of things with regards to security um, guarantees or assumptions that we make with the, with the EVM. But yeah, I, I don't know, I quite like it by now. All right, uh, uh, Jonathan, um, how do you feel about like insurance against smart contract vulnerabilities. Overrated, underrated, that's where to start. I guess I'd, I mean, if I, I'd probably say, um, I'm gonna say underrated because I, I don't really think it's widely adopted and used at this point, and I think it's a, it's a, uh, it's based on where we're at. Mm -hmm. As, as a, you know, our risk tolerance is really high and our, you know, our skin in the game is really high and, um, and, and our risk levels are not well understood, so it's hard to get insurance, yeah. if not impossible for a lot of us. So I think that'll change. That's going to change for sure. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I say underrated. I think it'll change and then... Yeah, there'll be hedges and in insurance, and I mean it is happening. It's not like it isn't happening, but I think it'll it will yeah. happen more, um, and hopefully, you know, some of the work that some of us do up here will help yeah. everybody understand the risk better, so that insurance will be obtainable and things like that for those who want it. Yeah, right. I do. I do like. I'll, I will give one. I haven't given many opinions. I don't think, but. I think that having somebody try to price risk uh, who is not an auditor, auditors don't want to price risk. They like look for bugs, right? But, and it's a totally different thing to be in, uh, what is, an actuary. So, but there should be actuaries and maybe they are the ones, maybe they audit the auditors. Yeah, they have an and, incentive to do and so. And we're working, what I'm, what yeah. I'm hoping, and, and we're doing some work with, with the actuaries and, and, and with the insurance companies to make sure that insurance in this industry does not go the route of insurance in, quote, cybersecurity, mm -hmm. where, I mean, I thought it was quite hilarious about a week ago when Lloyd's of London got hit with, with a cyber, and like, they can't set actuarial terms if they can't even secure their own systems. Yeah. What, what we're really hoping for is that, that 
people doing security reviews can set those standards so that, that the insurance companies are actually as passionate about what they do, that they're getting into it not just because, oh, look at that, it's a new adjacent market that we can get into, okay. and much more around, wow, this is really innovative stuff, we should get in there to make it safer. And mm. we're working with several people like that, and I'm, I'm very hopeful, so I'm, I'm with you about underrated. Interesting, okay, uh, is the audience ready? Does anybody have a mic and a question? Yeah, I do. All right, let's just, uh, Mike, if you, I can hear you, so if, I'll, I'll repeat it. Oh, somebody's, somebody's set up. Okay, go ahead, please. Hey. Uh, yeah. So, uh, I was wondering, because of all the monitoring tools that are coming out, like FOTA, for example, and there is also private mempools, is it really overrated? Mm. Oh, so you, you keep, I like, you're using the format. Uh, I don't know, who should I give that to? Like, it's What's the question? Uh, is, is, mo it's about monitoring. Um, is monitoring, uh, like mempool monitoring, overrated or underrated? Specifically mempool monitoring? I think or so. Just, is, that, is, let's, your, let's, let's, is your question monitoring in general? Yeah. Is it, monitoring overrated? Yeah, yeah. so uh, uh, like for, for example, like uh, th there are products out there that claim that they could like maybe detect hacks and all that, uh, or maybe secure uh, your smart contracts, that kind of a thing, but a hacker could use like a private mempool to like really send these transactions across and to even to react, right? You, your transaction may be I'm, I'm going to say, let's talk after. <laughs> Not sure it's real, but what I'll say is that um, I don't think there's anybody claiming that we've solved monitoring in the ecosystem. Nobody's claiming that or that we can stop threats. But I, I, what I will say is that I think we're all I think there's a lot of agreement that security is not just a time box security review. If, you, if that's all you do, good luck. And, and there are things you should be doing upstream and considering like formal verification and fuzzing and various techniques. So time box security review part, is part of it and there's things you should do, so pre-release, Pre-deployment, post-deployment, there's things you should do and monitoring's part of it. And so there's value to an end-to-end -end security and I think that's where we're at. Okay. Is it we're more starting to appreciate yeah. that. Anyone right. want to sneak in quickly while we move the mic over? Yeah. Uh, go ahead, Alex, you're up next, Mike, don't worry. Hi, uh, do your clients request public reports and when you write reports, who do you write the report for? Um, yes, so I was, I was telling one of my uh, team members the other day that uh, what we sell effectively is PDFs. Obviously joking a bit, but yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, yes, it's, it's critical. The output of the work that we do is a security assessment report, uh, which you know, contains your standard executive summary, detailed description of all the vulnerabilities identified and uh, recommendations. Um, who do we write that for? That's an excellent question. We write that for our clients. Now the problem that uh, we may see quite often in our space is uh, you know, readers um, sort of going through, or well, users of the protocols that we review, going through our reports and not necessarily understanding, again, the concept of a time box security assessment. In a lot of cases, the scope that we actually um, go through is a limited part of the entire protocol. This happens quite often, particularly with very, very complex systems. Um, and unfortunately, some users may use our security assessment reports and say, look, this protocol is absolutely safe because this auditing firm has only found a couple of, you know, mediums and lows and informationals and they've all been resolved. Because they the, passed your audit, right? Exactly, so, that's right. They check. passed the audit, the big check mark. Uh, none of us here provide, you know, any big green check mark in our auditing reports. There's plenty of other firms that do that, unfortunately. Um, so yeah, I think, I think you're absolutely right. The audience of uh, these, these security assessment reports is, um, is a tricky one. Um, Let me sneak a, another question in. If a client asks you to remove something, so or rephrase no. something, oh, are you writing it uh, for the client? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, this, no, this happens quite often. I'm sure. I'm sure that like it happens okay. quite often. Yeah, I'll take it. Uh, no, 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 no. I mean, I mean, a client can argue on the severity of a bug, yeah. right? And that's absolutely fine. You know, we're more than happy to have that conversation and be like, okay, why do you think this is not a critical? Like, look, I've got 
systems off chain in place to prevent this from happening that I would actually drop down the likelihood of exploitation. And we're like, okay, fair. I'm happy to drop down the likelihood, which would effectively impact the severity of the bug. But removing a bug from a report, if it's valid, hell no. Now, this goes against the trusted advisor role which we play. And, and how to read our reports, or I think all of our reports, is that it isn't that check mark. And what I want to see from a customer is I want to see them come out with our original report, which we will not change. And so you as, as the public can look at the report and see the problems that they faced. And then you can look at the fix review report, which is separate or an appendix, it's just, it's, it's different. And see, okay, you can actually watch the progression as they're taking the advice, they're understanding not just how to fix that bug, but how to fix bugs like that from happening at all. And, and some companies are afraid to do that because people will think that they're not good at security. I look at it as the exact opposite. A, co a company that is proud to say, look, these are the challenges we faced and here are the innovative solutions that we came up with to address them. That's where I want to look because now they're, they're actually taking our advice and they're, yeah. and they're doing what they should do with an audit. Is, is there, I, I want to like, is, Chandra, is there a, a difference in the way that like a report needs to be presented when it's like heavy on formal verification? I mean, I don't think so. I mean, we have very similar reports and like Mehdi said, right, like we uh, have the severity of the bugs and uh, we explain exactly what property we wrote and why that corresponds to the bug. And uh, I think the only additional thing that we very much emphasize is that, you know, uh, like this, like be careful that don't yeah. uh, just take yeah. this as like the, you know, uh, this is not a yeah. silver bullet and like the, yeah, I think there's no difference to be honest in terms of the reports we write. Um, okay, Mike, thank you for waiting. Um, so uh, disclosure, I work with Jonathan at Open Zeppelin, but I didn't tell about the question ahead of time, so there's no front running here. Um, if you could wave your hand and every single developer in the space, but most especially your clients, just automatically follow the best practice without you having to tell them ever again, what would it be? Yeah, yeah. I, I, it was a bit echoey, but uh, if you could magically, like if, if you could be sure that every client, if there's one best practice that you wish every client would, would adhere to, what would it be? Um, who's feel, yeah, all right. I've got one, do not change commits mid reviews, please. Thank you. <laughs> should, I, okay. should I start formal verification at the, very beginning and continuously throughout the project or only at the very end? Oh, that's such a good question. Uh, so the question is, do you want, should you start formal verification towards the end or do, towards the beginning of your development? So this is a very interesting question. You should start as early as you can. That's uh, based on you know, our experience. I think that's the right place to uh, start thinking about. Uh, formal verification. I think the most important thing there is, you know, you, uh, it really helps you sort of write your code in the most simple, modular way because that's really what is best suited for formal verification. And, you know, it just, it automatically just prevents you from making certain mistakes. And I think it's extremely important, even if you are, you know, uh, it, no matter what kind of verification technique you're using, the earlier you start, the better. And Along the same lines, you know, writing your specs out in English uh, and also like, you know, gradually making them somewhat more formal, I think the earlier you do it, the better. Like once you've already implemented your code, trying to come up with an invariant or like trying to write down the pre and post conditions and stuff, it's, it gets really hard, so. I think there's like, I, I like the shift left security meme, which is like it, basically just the idea if you think that your time and your process is moving from left to right, Writing, writing your code, then writing your specs and tests is doing it on the right-hand side. So uh, the more that you can do any of these things, your specs, formal verification, test writing, earlier in the process, generally the better your outcome will be. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Think, yeah. So I have a question for you. I think Jonathan and uh, Nick were touching upon it, but crypto is a very narrative-driven industry in general. And if we zoom out a little bit, and get outside of the uh, security eco chambers. What are some narratives that you want to see, and what are some narratives you want to correct that are uh, floating out right now in terms of security? 
Did you catch? The, uh, I'll, I'll try to. So you said you said it was. This is a very. We're in an early stage right now. We're in an echo chamber of security conversation, and we need like. I'm struggling. Yeah, I was going to say if we if we make an assumption that security community within crypto uh, is is on the on the table, and there is a broader developer community outside as well, uh, who are all developing, building the tools, who are. Uh, susceptible to certain narratives. What are some narratives that are floating around, around security, around how people see security audits, around how people see security in general, that you want to take the chance to like correct if you see anything wrong? Uh, what, what are some ways okay, you want to like address? I think we got it. I think we got it. All right. So I'll just repeat it for, for everyone it. from what I heard and correct me if I misheard. Um, bad narratives in our industry that should be corrected, okay. um, hopefully you know, quickly and, and early on. Um, so anybody want that to that's all. I yeah. think like got that. What are you angry about? <laughs> <laughs> See, I know. I know how to like. To speak um, to. I'm angry about a a lot of the raises that happened in the security industry recently. I think the the the, the um, money and capitalism is creating legitimacy f for for people that have not demonstrated proficiency. So this is a narrative that really grinds my gears, for example. Um, wow. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's, I think that says it. That's, yeah. Yeah, so, I'll, I'll so, give someone okay. else that. I'll sneak in a smart contract to availability here. All right, since Gonzalo started with things that make us angry, I'll, I'll do one too. The, um, well, I think that the, our desire for cost efficiency and time efficiency is not in our best interests. And I mean gas savings and speed of transfer from a layer two to a layer one through the bridge that was just developed yesterday. Like, and our lack of acceptance on latency on anything so that we could do more security verification. So I think these things work against us and I understand why we're doing them. And how they're helping initially, but I hope the narrative changes so that we um, aren't as worried about gas savings and we're more, and we aren't as worried about speed and we're a little more worried about security and safety for the users. Hello, everyone. Uh, my question is, is uh, if auditing is good enough or would you consider like uh, alternatives like Open Arena or Bounty Bolts like Hats Finance, for example? or maybe deploying two medium tier uh, auditors or just one top tier auditor per contract, considering timeline? So I'm not sure I fully understood the question, but I think it's, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you asked if auditing is good enough, then why do we need uh, the bounties? Let's, make, like let's the, make it more that... general. I, like we, we sort of, I, I, think, I think I'll get, we, we'll get this. Is like, like just generally, we have some new alternatives to audits that have emerged. Giant bounties uh, and, and like Code Arenas and Sherlock doing these uh, like auditing competitions that are a little bit like a time boxed uh, bounty program. So yeah. um, how does that, uh, how does that like substitute or complement auditing? <laughs> I, I don't know if that's, I don't know if anyone said, like we might, yeah. But I, my answer is, is back to what I said a little bit before, which is a, a bounty can give you that, this bug, which is interesting, but it's not really as interesting as, as how you are working with, this is a, this is a holistic view of, of all of the code by, by engineers who are deeply and intimately involved with the code to the same extent that, that your internal people are, but they're seeing it from, through a different lens. They're seeing it through the lens of people who have literally watched everything that could go wrong, go wrong, and, and being able to see mistakes in everything from documentation to, to just your, your overall maturity. It's a different set of things. If you, want, if you want to find specific bugs and fix those, that's great. There, there's other things that are, that are outside the, the general scope of what we do in a security review. Uh, I, I'm not suggesting that that audit or security review is the, the be all and end all, but it's also uh, different from a lot of things that I'm seeing out there. And, and as far as automation goes, we use automation to find sort of low-hanging fruit or to point us in the right direction so that humans can look at it and mm -hmm. make educated decisions about what we think. And there's a lot more than just run this tool, see what you get, and hand over the report. Anyone else quickly? We're, we're running low on time.
Um, so I, no, 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 no. Whoa, 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 sorry, 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 no, no, that's, I meant on the stage, like, if anybody wanted to, all right, I'm gonna be selfish, too, there's something I, but in the time we have, I really want to plant this idea as much as possible, is that it's not the auditor's job, they're not selling you security, in my opinion, they're selling you, like, insight into your ability to write secure code, yeah. so you need to take responsibility for writing secure code, uh, and not, act as if like you just get to write code that does cool stuff and then give it to the auditor and they will make it safe for you. So you need to focus on being able to write secure code, whatever process you think that might need, whatever tool you think that requires, and then you give the auditor your code so that you can understand how close you are to being able to write secure code. Amen. It took me a long time to get there. So it's a bit of an epiphany and I'm trying to Unfortunately, we see what John was describing way too often. And yeah, it'd be great if we can all collectively shift um, towards a different um, yeah, definition of, of what our work here means. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay, there was another question, so let's have it. I yeah, think so we do. Um, Foundry, when Foundry first came out, uh, I was surprised by the fact that it included fuzzing. So my question is, when does fuzzing make sense on these code bases, which are generally open source and small, and how do you approach fuzzing in your use for auditing? Fuzzing makes a lot of sense all of the time. It's, it, we, we go into the, like the shift left, uh, shift security left narrative and all of that. Like you, sh you should use all the tools. Literally, uh, you you should write specs. If you have specs, fuzzing will work better, right? Um, so uh, I don't. Yeah, you should just do it all the time. Use Foundry and use all the other tools. Use Echidna. Use Harvey. By the way, forgot to say I've been announcing this the entire week, but this is the panel. We at Diligence will be open sourcing all our tools, just like Trillabits. We are a bit behind schedule, but at least better late than never. So even Harvey. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. All the code bases. So yeah. Did you? Uh, I just want to, yeah, I guess I, to add to what Gonzalo said, I think uh, using tools is actually good. So fuzzing makes sense to me. I mean, you know, again, it's not a guarantee, but, you know, I think uh, it's just like good software engineering, right? Like you write code and you want to write tests and you want to do fuzzing and you want to write specs. And these are all good software engineering practices. And I think they also just are, they carry to this domain as well. So it makes sense. Um, the one, the one comment about th that you just made, well, both of you, like uh, th that, the declaration of things, the, the ability to, to set forth a spec, uh, and then and then fuzz around that. That's really important. That first part is what Jocelyn and and Gustavo are going to be doing tomorrow. There's going to be a two-hour workshop on how do you declare these things, how do you actually set out yep. and and describe invariants, and how how can you use those to make your fuzzing more effective. So I would really recommend that that you cool. go to that. So just to be fair, I know like we're out of time by this timer. Let's give every speaker like 30 seconds to, sorry? All right, so we started the questions way early. We've got tons of time. Um, I should have read the manual. Um, did, did, uh, Brian, I know Brian had his hand up at one point. Um, and, okay, you, please, just, yeah, just like, I'll, I'll repeat it through the mic, so go ahead. That's, that's cool. Is there a way to make like, the, the output of, of audits machine readable? Um, and it's interesting because we, we do actually... We, that's that, either right. Yeah. yeah, it, yeah. <laughs> no, I wasn't going to go there. I was going to go... That, that, that's really interesting, and I think we're going to take that up and t talk to us, hit us up afterwards. Um, I, I think it's going to really depend on the writing style of, of the security firm that you engage with. Um, but it, it is something I'd like to think about a bit more, yeah. Um, Perhaps we could parse some of those uh, reports into a readable format or a machine readable format. That shouldn't be too hard to do. We write a report in uh, reports in LaTeX, so it should be pretty trivial for us to do. Cool. So uh, at Sertura, actually, we do have we have been working on a related things. So um, I don't know if you've ever heard like there's things like deoxygen or doxygen. I don't know how to pronounce it. And like there's also uh, NatSpec is another uh, similar library. So uh, the nice thing about, you know, if you, are, if you have a formal spec, it's actually a little bit easier to, like, sort of convert that to a format because you can annotate 
uh, your code, and then you can automatically generate some kind of a, a formatted report from, from that. So I think it's a good idea. Uh, hey, guys. Kevin over here. Uh, hey, friends. Um, so having come from sort of the security side and now being protocol engineer and founder, um, I'm wondering about this, this line you tread as an author of being very slow, methodical, you know, heavy testing, core protocol, must be super secure, to now, okay, now I'm wanting to move a bit faster, uh, maybe their integration contracts or uh, something that's not in my core protocol. Um, you know, how much time am I spending in testing and in auditing? How much money am I spending there versus move fast and, and see if things work? Uh, I wonder if there's, I have my own opinion, but I'm interested to hear what's on the stage. I'll just quickly, I'll say um, the most secure code is the code that never hits mainnet. So just keep testing. I also think it depends on how much money you raised or how much money you have. And now it's like, it's very, it's a very practical thing, you know, like you can spend a lot of time and resources doing, doing, writing tests. But at the end of the day, if you run out of money and you only have the tests, you're probably fucked. Okay, cool. It might come off as somewhat pedantic, but I'm curious, looking at the different way that auditing firms do severity or impact and then uh, difficulty slash likelihood, uh, I'll be honest, I like when, I prefer uh, likelihood so that it's like uh, difficulty is low when yeah. likelihood is high. So uh, I was just wondering, you know, high likelihood and high impact would equal high severity. Have you seen clients get confused about this different and, and without being overly like strict as the industry is still developing? I'm also curious about like how we might classify things. Trail of Bits has a nice classification. Uh, SWC seems like outdated and not updated uh, as well as or maybe it could be going forward. Are there things that we can do as an industry to improve and start to I hate to say solidify, but structure our information architecture a little bit more so that clients can understand when they're getting multiple audit reports and uh, reduce confusion. Uh, I think I think it's uh, yeah, it's a great point as, as you said. Uh, well, for us at, for us at, at CGP, high likelihood, high impact, critical. Um, and I think we all use perhaps similar types of risk rating matrices. Um, it, it's probably beneficial if we could standardize on um, on how we would write severity. So as you said, it's typically likelihood of exploitation, impact of exploitation. Um, but there's different levels. So we only have, we got four of them at CIGP. Um So informational, low, medium, high, and critical. That's actually five. Um, but yeah, I think, I think it's a great idea. There's been a lot of uh, initiatives over the past few years on the ETH security channel to try to standardize some of this stuff. It's never happened. I don't, I don't really know why, um, but I think it would be, it would be quite beneficial. Uh, I'm gonna give you a bit of a left field question. So there's been a few regulatory proposals that includes uh, software security best practices in the proposal. Uh, what sorts of standards that are driven by regulations could be, do you think could be damaging to the space and what ones do you think could be good? Like, like so, so almost like, uh, yeah, the typical, like, like a regular comes out of nowhere and they're maybe a bit naive. What kind of damage could they perhaps do by uh, misunderstanding? Well, I think, I, I don't know if it goes to like the intent of your question having to do with structure of code, I think we all know we're concerned about regulations that would impose requirements on protocols to be able to block certain parties as an example. So I think the biggest, are, a lot of our concerns are around regulations that would have requirements. I don't know if that goes to your thought about the question having to do with specific like, developer I, I imagine, processes. Like, your contracts must be upgradable for whatever reason. Yeah, those things are always yeah. damaging. If, if you're talking about regulations at the code level, I think there's no way they can be good, you know? Like, I, okay. I think that um, as an example, having worked in uh, security before and in the, in the cloud space, the SOC 2 standard 
I, I'm actually, I, I believe it has a lot of really good aspects to the software development, the secure, security focused processes of your software development life cycle. And I think those are good practices. And if teams were transparent about the processes they follow, I, I think that's healthy and if held to a certain standard. All those things always have downsides in terms of the effort that goes into auditing them and proving them. But. Yeah, the, the life cycle of regulation is really tough. Um, getting, getting regulators and government officials to understand the key areas, uh, they, they have a goal of what they want to accomplish, but usually they're, they're rather far behind the technology. I think it's up to us, every, everybody here, we certainly do this, I, I bet everybody else up here does this. We spend a lot of time talking to regulators about what is possible and what isn't. We spend a lot of time talking about the intent and trying to come up with sort of more, more open suggestions to industry as opposed to specific, because if, if you say thou shalt do the following, it's always going to be out of date by the time it, it passes. And, and it just becomes very, very difficult. So I think that w the, the best thing that we can do, the most practical thing we can do is educate those, those people who would regulate us. Thanks for clarifying, Brian. Uh, yeah, that makes a lot more sense. Um, just to give you guys maybe a, a, an exotic uh, perspective, uh, I was catching up with uh, some of the regulators in, in Australia a few weeks ago, um, and this is exactly what they were asking for. They said, what should we be you know, requesting from projects to do in terms of security uh, practices, in terms of security development, secure development, um, and you know what should we be regulating in the space? So I try to sort of convince them to go down the educational part, and um, and yeah, this is this is spot on. I think it's certainly something that is happening, at least in Australia. These, these people are starting these conversations and are starting to realize the need of. You, you can't enforce these things on projects, but at least you can have these set of guidelines and point your users, your you know, citizens, to these guidelines and get them to demand these standards, this set of um, minimum requirements from the projects they interact with. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much.